If you take and turn with me, please, to the book of Philippians. Philippians chapter 2. And this morning we're going to be looking at verses 5 through 11. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 11. You have the uh, envelopes in your bulletin for one day to feed the world. Um, on the inside of the envelope, you'll see there's a place that you can put credit card information. If you'd like to uh, give a donation by credit card, you can do that. But uh, please don't mail these in. Just bring them back and place them in the offering next Sunday. And just make your checks out to New Life. If you're doing the credit card, you can fill out that information. And uh, we'll send it all in together uh, with our church. And inside the, bullet, inside the envelope, there's a, also like a bookmark. So you don't want to miss out on that. The perfect God encounter. We've been talking about these encounters of, of, with God that mankind has had. Different encounters that took place in the life of men who are facing trials sometimes, personally, who are going through times with their nation, Israel, who are facing challenging situations. And it was times when God showed up on the scene in such a powerful way that there was no denying that it was an encounter with God. And yet all these encounters that we've been talking about, even though they were great, even though they were amazing, they were nothing compared to the perfect God encounter. And I want us to see exactly what that perfect God encounter was this morning. And we'll find it in Philippians chapter 2. And it begins to tell us that the perfect encounter that mankind has ever had with God was found in the incarnation, was found when Jesus Christ came to earth. You see, church, the perfect model for us to pattern our lives after is Jesus Christ. He is the perfect one for us to imitate. In order to know how to be like God, to serve God, to, to get closer to God, he sent us his only son for us to imitate. He sent his only son for us to get an idea of what it means to be a servant. You see, Jesus gave up his rights and he sacrificially served mankind even to the point of, a point of suffering, a cruel death upon the cross. But he didn't just suffer that cruel death on the cross to say, hey, look at me, I'm a martyr. No, he suffered that on the cross for you and for me. He suffered the cruel death on the cross so that we could have life and have it forever. As we celebrate Palm Sunday, we celebrate the triumphal entry and we, it leads up to, to, to Good Friday. And when you think about Good Friday, how good really was it? I mean, they had taken Jesus, they had beaten, they placed him on the cross to die. There the Bible tells us that he cried out to his father, why have you forsaken me? And he bowed his head and he died. What was so good about that? You see, in the mind of most humans, there is nothing good about that. But for those of us that look beyond the cross, we look to the empty grave, we find that there was something absolutely amazing about Good Friday. You see, Jesus gave his rights and sacrificially served mankind so that you and I might have life. Look, if you would, at Philippians chapter 2, beginning with verse number 5. Have this attitude yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant, and being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, listen to this, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. You see, church, Jesus knew who he was. I want you to understand that this morning and write this down if you would. Jesus knew who he was. When he came to earth, he knew exactly who he was. When he went to the cross, he knew who he was. When he rose again on the third day, Jesus knew who he was. But the question this morning is, do you know who you are? Jesus certainly knew who he was, but do you know who you are this morning? 
Verse 6 tells us that Jesus existed as God, which means that he has always been in existence. Jesus has always been. From the very beginning, he has been. He is today, and he forevermore will be. Jesus has always existed. You see, church, Jesus isn't merely like God. He is God. I mean, you could go around and you could say, you know what, uh, Woody, you're like God. Carol, you're like God. We could go through the room. We could say all of us are like God because the Bible says that we were all created in the image of God. So there is some likeness of God in us. But none of us can say we are gods. None of us can even say we are little gods. You are not a little God. You were created in the image of God, so you may be like him, but you are not God. And yet this passage of Scripture tells us that Jesus existed as God. He is God. Woven all throughout the New Testament, we find passage after passage that confirms who Jesus Christ is. Not just who he was, not just what he did, but who he is. Hebrews chapter 1, verse number 3. It says, The Son is the radiance of God's glory, the exact representation of his being." sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down, listen to this, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Jesus humbled himself, left heaven, came down to earth. He gave up his life so that you and I might have life. And then the Bible says he rightfully took his place back in heaven, seated beside the Father. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. The fullness of God never left Jesus Christ. Yes, he came as a man, but as he was a man, the Bible says the fullness of the deity dwelt within Christ. John chapter 14, verses 8 through 9 say this. Philip said, Lord, show us the Father, and that will be enough for us. Jesus answered, don't you know me, Philip? Even after I have been among you so much a long time, anyone who has seen me, listen, anyone who has seen me, Jesus says, has seen the Father. How can you say, Philip, show us the Father? Here are the disciples walking with Jesus, they're talking with Jesus, and they say, hey, hey, can you just show us the Father? Can we get a glimpse of, of who God is? Missing out the whole time that right before them was God. Jesus says, hey, I am God. How can you ask to see the Father? Don't you recognize, don't you understand who I am? You don't need to see the Father because I am God. You see, church, this is so important for us to understand as we go into this Easter season, as we go through our life, that Jesus Christ is God. God. He wasn't just some man that came to earth and did some great miracles. He wasn't just some man that came to earth and, 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 and changed water into wine and, and talked about, uh, about loving other people. No, he was a man, and yet he was fully God. There's no question Jesus knew who he was, but do you know who you are? Maybe you're here this morning and you're lost, you're searching. Maybe you're scared, you're worried, maybe you're going through a time of hurt. Maybe you're depressed, you're upset about something that's taking place. Who are you this morning? Are you those things? Are you those emotions? Or are you a child of God? Are you lost and searching, scared and worried, hurt and depressed? Or this morning, are you forgiven? Are you loved? Are you secure? Have you been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb? Are you adopted into the family of Christ? Have you been reconciled to God? Yes, you may be hurting, you may be struggling, but have you given your life to Jesus Christ, this one who came and died for you? You see, God sent his son, and Jesus knew exactly who he was. The question is, do you know who you are this morning? Because until you understand who you are in Christ, you will always struggle with all the other things. You'll always struggle with hurt. You'll always struggle with offense. You'll always struggle with pain. You'll always struggle with questions. But until you know who you are in Christ, will all those things disappear? See, unless you know who you are, you can't follow the example of Jesus Christ. If you don't recognize that you are His, then you can't follow His example. Oh, you may try to do what He does, but it'll, it, it, it won't work out because you don't belong to Him. See, Jesus surrendered his rights. 
He embraced obs- obscurity. He served and he sacrificed. And he could do that because he knew who he was. He didn't question who he was. Lord, I am willing to lay down my life for the world because he knew who he was. He knew he was God, and he knew the results that would take place. John 13, 13 says, You call me teacher and Lord, and rightly so, for that is what I am. Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should also wash one another's feet. You see, even though Jesus knew who he was, even though he was God, He still humbled himself as a servant. Philippians chapter 2 also tells us that Jesus gave up his heavenly rights. He gave up his rights so that he could be a servant. Some people think that Jesus was forced into dying on the cross, that God was up in heaven and said, hey, Jesus, you know what, it's time, and there's no way out of this. I am going to make you die on the cross. God never made his son die on the cross. Jesus willfully said, I will go, Father. I know it's the only way that mankind can be redeemed. I know it's the only way that sins can be forgiven. So I will go. We need to remember Jesus is God, and that means that he has the rights of God. And yet the verse says this, he did not grasp equality with God. You see, he had it, he he had that, but he chose not to cling to to it. He had the equality of God because he was God, but it says, I gave up that right. I am not going to brag about my right of being God. He didn't use his rights of deity for self-promotion or for self-protection. He didn't come to earth and say, hey, I'm God. Everybody look at me, and and this is the way it's going to be. No, he gave up that right and became a man to dwell among us. Jesus was tempted in every way that we were. The Bible says that he was out in the desert and he was fasting and praying. And after he had fasted and prayed for 40 days that, that the enemy showed up, Satan showed up. And he said, come on, Jesus, just cast yourself down off this mountain. Cast yourself down and call upon your angels. They'll catch you. They'll, they'll lift you up. Come on, Jesus, take these stones and, and turn these stones into bread. If you really are God, just go ahead and do it. Prove it to me right now. Jesus said, I could have done that. I can do that because I am God. But listen to this, Matthew chapter 26, verse 53. Peter, they were all in the garden and Jesus was about to be arrested. And they came after Jesus and Peter drew his sword and and he cut off the ear of the the servants and and Jesus scolded him. He said, Peter, put away your sword. Put away your sword. And listen to what he said. He said, I could have called 12 legions, 72,000 angels to protect me. I could have called all these angels to come and get me out of this situation right now, but I have chosen not to because I have a work that must be done. I am humbling myself as a servant. I am humbling myself so that you might have life. The next phrase sums it up pretty much. He says, I have taken on, listen to this, I have taken on the form of a slave. Jesus said, I could call upon all the angels of heaven, but I have chosen to take on the form of a slave. That same word used, the form of God, the the form of God that talks about, I'm giving up my rights. Form of a slave. Why would he choose that word? Because when you think about it, slaves have no rights. A slave has no rights. Jesus was identifying himself not with the rich and powerful, not with just the poor, but he was identifying himself with the slaves. Oh, I can call upon the angels, but no, I have given myself up as a slave. Jesus was God. Jesus is God. 2,000 years ago, he didn't suddenly cease to be God. But instead, he added a human nature to to his divine nature. And so doing, for a period of time, he set aside his divine rights. Look, if you would, down Philippians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8, it said, He made himself nothing. He made himself a slave by taking on the very nature of a servant. 
being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself. Jesus embraced obscurity. Jesus made himself nothing in the eyes of man. Think about it. When Jesus was born, where did the Magi go to find him? The Magi, they went to Jerusalem. They went to the city center. They went to where they would find the king. They were looking for this king that would come and rule and reign. And they went and they went to Jerusalem and they did not find this king that was born. He wasn't there. He was born, however, in a manger to a peasant family. Born in a manger to people that were so obscure themselves that nobody even thought to look for him there. When we look at the incarnations in other religions, God's becoming men, they always become someone great among men, some majestic, powerful, somebody that's unmistakable. In Egypt, the pharaohs were considered to be manifestations of gods themselves. They were big, they were mighty, they were these huge rulers, and they came and they, they threw their power around and said, look at me, I am a god. But that's not what we find with Jesus. Jesus became just an ordinary man, like you and me. If you think about the encounters that we've taken a look at, there is not one person who missed the points when they had an encounter with God. They had those shock and awe moments when, when God would show up in their presence. They'd just be like, oh my, there is no mistake, and this is God. <laughs> Moses at the burning bush knew it was God. Job in the presence of God knew that God had showed up. Elijah on the mountain knew that God was there. Paul, when he was, when he was stricken by that light and became blind, he knew it was an encounter with God. There was no mistaking it. Yet in the case of Jesus, everybody missed it. Everybody missed it. They missed who Jesus was. They missed the reason that he came. No one said, oh, here finally in this manger is God coming to explain himself. Finally, here is God coming to redeem his people. It's interesting that God chose the shepherds on a hill to announce the birth of our Savior. Shepherds, they, they were considered even lower than the slaves at the time. And they were the ones that were going to announce the birth of Jesus. See, when Jesus came, his humanity was veiled. It veiled God's glory in his life. Isaiah chapter 53 verse 2 says, He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of the dry ground. He had no beauty, he had no majesty to attract us to him. Nothing in his appearance that we should even desire him. The incarnation didn't only veil God's glory, it also revealed God's glory. John chapter 1 verse 8 says, No one has ever seen God but the one and only Son who is himself God and is the closest relationship with the Father has made him known. You see, God wanted to make himself known, church. God wants to make himself known to you and I this morning. And so he chose his Son to reveal the essential character of God. He chose his Son, Jesus Christ, to reveal the number one character of who God is. And it's found in John chapter 3 verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his son. The number one character, the, who God is, the Bible says that God is love. And so he chose to express that love by giving us his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus is the incarnation of that love. Jesus is love for you and I this morning. For God so loved you while you were a sinner. God so loved you while you were committing that crime. God so loved you while you were cussing and swearing. God so loved you while you were lying and stealing. God so loved you that he sent his only begotten son. He loved you in spite of who you are. In spite of who you were, in spite of who you'll even become, God loves you. And he says, I love you so much that I'm going to send my son. And Jesus gave up the rights of heaven and came to earth. God's love is a love that gives. You see, God's love is in a love that is grasping. God's love is in a love that is taking. God reaches down to broken people and he draws them to himself. God loves you this morning. He's reaching out and saying, will you come to me? Will you come to me? My arms are wide open. I love you. Just come and run into my arms. I'm here this morning. Verse number eight again, it says, being found in the appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, 
even death on the cross. I want you to see this, that Jesus himself chose sacrifice. He wasn't forced on the cross, but he chose it for his life. The Bible says he humbled himself. This was an, something that was foreign in this time. The Greek culture, Greek literature, when you talk about humility, it was considered a vice or a weakness. The Greeks rewarded lowliness or humanity as something that was shameful. It's not surprising when you look around our culture today, we're encouraged to promote ourselves, exalt ourselves, advance ourselves. We're encouraged to lift ourselves up even if it requires putting other people down. That's our culture today, and that's the culture of the Greek society back then. It was looked down upon if you humbled yourself, if you became a servant, if you were somebody that, that gave of their life. No, we're supposed to lift ourselves up. We're supposed to say, look at me, look at me, look at all that I'm doing. But it's amazing when you begin to puff yourself up, when you begin to build yourself up and have everybody looking at you, isn't it amazing that how quickly you'll fall? Because of your own selfishness. Look at the people in our society that build themselves up, that puff themselves up and say, look at me, I'm a great sports, uh, sportsman. I'm a, I'm a great financier. I, I can do all these different things. Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Because they've built things on the, the name of their own name instead of the name of God. British actor Michael Wilding was once asked if actors had any traits which set them apart from other human beings. Without a doubt, he replied, you can pick out actors by the glazed look that comes into their eyes when the conversation wanders away from themselves. Your greatest enemy to becoming like Jesus Christ Church, your greatest enemy to becoming like God is yourself. We are our own worst enemy. God's a giver, not a hoarder. God gives. God gave to us his son. The son gave up heaven. He became obedient even to death on the cross. Jesus said, no one takes my life from me. I willingly give my life. No one will take my life from me. I will lay down my life for others. It wasn't just any death. It was a cross death. It was the most shameful and painful form of death available in the Roman Empire. Roman writer Cicero said the, the very word cross should be far removed not only from the person of the Roman citizen, but from his thoughts, his eyes, and his ears. To bind a Roman citizen is a crime. To flog him is an abomination. To slay him is almost an act of murder. To crucify him is what? There is no fitting word that can possibly describe so horrible a deed. Today, church, we wear a cross around our neck like it's jewelry and we put them on our churches as decorations. But it wasn't the same in Jesus' time. You see, in Jesus' day, it would be like us wearing the symbol of an electric chair around our neck. We're not going to run out and purchase an electric chair and start wearing it around our neck. We're not going to have an electric chair up here on the, on the wall somewhere next Sunday. Why? Because it's gruesome. It's, it's degrading. It's, 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 it's the final act of, of life. It's being taken. And that's the way the cross was viewed in Jesus' day. And yet Jesus humbled himself and he said, I am willing, I said, I am willing to go to the cross because I know what it means. He says, I'm going to go to the cross for mankind. Romans 5, 6, and 8 tells us that Jesus willingly went to the cross that you and I might have life. Paul tells us that we are to become imitators of God, that we are to have the same attitude that Christ had, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We're to have that same attitude. Lord, I am recognizing that I'm a sinner, but Lord, I understand what you did for me. Lord, I'm willing to lay down my life for a friend. We need to relinquish our rights, embrace obscurity, choose to sacrificially serve. But for us, it's such a difficult pattern because the world says, no, get, 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 instead of give, give, give. So how do we find the strength and the desire to follow? How do we find this path that pleases God? This life that God says is good and wise. This life that God says, I will reward. If you humble yourself in my presence, if you humble yourself, then I will lift you up. I will reward you. I will pour out my blessings upon you. 
Philippians chapter 2, verses 9 through 11 talk about this. He says, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow and every tongue confess in heaven and under the earth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. I have given him the name which is above every other name, that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee shall bow and every tongue confess. You see, Jesus went to the cross. Listen, this is the main reason Jesus went to the cross, because he knew the reward that would come. He anticipated the reward that would take place, not for himself, but for you and for me. He was willing to die because he anticipated the reward, the reward offered to us in the, in the name of Jesus Christ. You see, he's unique, but God does promise us a reward for following the example. 1 Peter 5, 6 says, Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in the proper time. Proper time may not be today, but there will come a time when Jesus will lift you up. But he is our picture this morning. What's the picture telling us? When we look at the, the table here this morning, when we look at the communion elements, when we look at, 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 the, at the bread that represents his broken body. What is it telling us this morning? That Jesus Christ gave his life, that you might have life. When we look and we hold the cup in our hand, the, the grape juice, what does it represent? What, is it, what does it mean to us this morning? It means that Jesus shed his blood so that we wouldn't have to shed ours. That his blood was shed, that our sins might be forgiven. You see, he humbled himself to the point of death, but he knew that there was a reward for you and for me this morning. Fullness of joy is found when we place others ahead of ourselves. When we follow Jesus and, and bend low to sacrificially serve others, we find fullness of joy. There's no much lower Jesus could have gone. He humbled himself, became a man, lived his life on earth, walked and talked and discipled his his friends gave them examples of how to live their life, healed the sick, raised the dead, performed miracles. But that meant absolutely nothing if it wasn't for the cross. Because he'd have just been another man. He'd just been another man that could do miracles. He'd have just been another man that was, was powerful in the earth. It means nothing without the cross. Why do we celebrate communion? Why do we gather around the table of the Lord? It's to remember what he did for us. What he did for us, what he did for you, what he did for me. Not what he did for the people 2,000 years ago, but what he did for us. He gave his life that we might have life. He was the example for us. On this Palm Sunday, are we recognizing that Jesus, yes, he rode into the city. There was a triumphal entry. Yes, the crowds were cheering, Hosanna, Hosanna. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. But just that quickly, they forgot all about him. And they turned and said, crucify him, crucify him. Are we going to be like that? Are we coming to church on Sunday and we sing hallelujah, praise the Lord, hosanna, hosanna, worship you, Lord, we glorify you. And when we walk out the doors, all of a sudden we turn and we begin to curse him. And say, oh, I don't want to have any part of him. And then come back next week and say, oh, yeah, wait a second, I, did, I need to do it all over again. God is calling us to be faithful. Fullness of joy is found only when we place others ahead of ourselves. Just like Jesus. He placed others ahead of himself. And he found the Lord. When we follow Jesus and bend low sacrificially to serve, he says, I will reward you. I will give back to you. The Bible says that when we receive communion, we're to examine our hearts. Examine our life. This morning I would challenge you to do that. Are you examining your own life? Is your life becoming more and more like Jesus? Are you humbling yourself more and more to become like him? Are you out for yourself to get all that you can? Are you committed to yourself above everybody else? Or are you committed to Jesus first? Because if you're committed to him first, then you will serve others. If you're committed to yourself, listen, let me tell you, the only thing that's going to come out of it is misery. Misery. In the end, it's just going to be misery. Oh, it might be okay now, but in the end, it's going to be misery. 
Where are you in your life? When's the last time you chose to serve somebody? When's the last time you chose to just serve? This week, can you do that? Can you choose to serve somebody? I'm not talking about your regular people that you do something for, your family, your friends. Choose to serve somebody else. Jesus chose to serve all of us. He chose to serve his disciples. He washed their feet. Nobody was there at the door to greet them and to wash their dirty feet. And so Jesus said, okay, I'm going to take care of this. I'm going to choose to wash your feet. Jesus chose to serve his disciples around that table. And he, he passed the cup and he passed the bread. And he said, I am giving up my life that you might have life. Listen to this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 3 and 4. It says, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider others better than yourselves. Each of you should look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. Jesus looked out from heaven, and he said, I need to go. He was looking for the interests of all of us when he laid down his life. When he went to the cross. When he humbled himself. Oh, he looked down and I guarantee you he saw your filthiness. He saw your sin. He saw your anger, your rage, your malice. He saw your deceitfulness and he said, I can't stay here. I need to go. I need to redeem them. I I need to give them the opportunity to come back to the Father doesn't matter the sin god is able to forgive god is able but he's just saying would you come to me i gave my life that you might have life would you bow your heads this morning lord in just a moment we're going to be partaking in communion to remember what you did for us But before we do that, we want to do what your word says to examine our hearts. So right now, would you just take this moment and examine your life? When you look inside your life, do you find areas where you have done something wrong, where you have sinned, where you have where you've lied, where you've stolen, where you've cheated, where you've been unfaithful? Can you point to things in your life that you're not proud of? That you just say, man, I wish I could get that back. I wish I could do it all over again. See, that's why Jesus came. God doesn't allow do-overs, but God allows for our sins to be forgiven once and for all. He allows us to come and into his presence, and he washes us. The Bible says he will cleanse us of our sins. He'll forgive us. And he says, you don't need to go back and do it over, but from here on forward, this is how you now need to live. Leave the past behind and move forward. Maybe you're here this morning and you've, you've never given your life to Jesus. You're hearing this for the first time today that he loved you so much that he humbled himself and he gave his life for you. But today you recognize you need to ask him to come into your life. You simply say, Lord, come into my life. Forgive me of my sins. I thank you that you left your place in heaven and came to earth and died for me. And so today I receive that forgiveness. Lord, I accept you as my Savior today. I accept you as my Savior. Maybe you've given your life to the Lord and it's been years, maybe recently, and yet you've, you've drifted away. You've allowed for the things, the cares, the burdens of this world just to weigh you down. And yet in this message this morning, you heard that God hasn't left, that he's still there. Just reach out to him and say, Lord, I'm coming back. I'm coming back. Forgive me, Lord God. I want to humble myself like you humbled yourself. Ultimately, will you choose to serve today?
We choose to serve Jesus. We reach out to those that nobody else will reach out to. We love the unlovable because really you're unlovable, but God so loved you that he gave his only begotten son. So Father, we look deep in our hearts today. We shine the flashlight of the Holy Spirit upon our lives. And if there's any sin, any impurity, any bitterness, Lord, we ask that you forgive us today.